you to the of our third season of Geography of Hope. My name is Monica Shear, and I'm the Director of Outreach here at Alaska Wilderness League, coming to you from Southeast Pennsylvania, which are the traditional homelands of the Lenape peoples. As land acknowledgements continue to grow in use and you may be hearing them more frequently or have questions, I did just wanna highlight quickly that we've recently posted a blog on land acknowledgements that I encourage you or anyone looking for more information or with questions to check out. I'm also excited to see so many of you here tonight. Um, thank you for continuing to make our Geography of Hope program such a success. Um, when we began this series a year and a half ago, we had no idea what to expect. And we're thrilled that so many of you continue to join and enjoy this program and that we have been able to provide so many unique and engaging speakers as they have agreed to be part of this series. As we kick off our third season, I wanted to highlight some exciting developments. Um, first off, past Geography of Hope series will soon be available as podcasts. Um, the Zoom recordings uh, that you've had access to will continue to be available. And we're just thrilled at the opportunity of adding a podcast version of these episodes to uh, create opportunities for new audiences to tune in and learn about so many of Alaska's iconic landscapes and issues. Uh, next month for episode two, we will welcome Max Rami, who will share his unique connection to Alaskan wilderness and how his journey along a 150 mile forgotten trail really helped shape his purpose. You'll enjoy his private sketchbooks, public videos, and personal anecdotes that highlight his experience um, <clears throat> and efforts to educate people about climate change in Alaska. And then in November for episode three, uh, if you join us, you will have the opportunity to hear from a panel of speakers who recently participated in a trip to the Arctic Refuge as part of a partnership between Alaska Wilderness League and Love is King which is an organization that aims to eliminate fear and establish safety for Black, Indigenous, and all peoples of color while on our public lands, and really create a reimagined outdoor environment focused on participation, representation, and most of all, inspiration. Mike Crenshaw, Alejandro Villavas, and Solomon Ibe will share their stories of learning and experiencing the many facets of the Arctic Refuge firsthand. And if that wasn't enticing enough, we will be back after the holidays uh, with a special member only event. So if you're not yet a member of Alaska Wilderness League, please consider joining us by year end so that you don't miss out. And now on to tonight's program. I'm so very pleased to welcome John Shane who will be presenting a Tongass Odyssey, seeing the forest ecosystem through the politics of trees, a biologist memoir, and just a few quick housekeeping items to help you get the most out of the program tonight. As you can see, or not hear, all participants will be muted throughout the program. You are welcome and encouraged to use the chat feature if you're joining us through Zoom. And within the chat feature, you can put any questions or comments you might have at any point throughout the program. My colleague, Lois Norgard, will be monitoring the chat, can answer some of your questions, and will be sharing links for additional resources. If you're joining by phone or otherwise unable to access the chat tonight or just want to focus on the program, do not worry. All the links that she shares tonight will be included in the follow-up email that will be sent tomorrow. And it will also include a full re recording of tonight's program. Again, you will have the opportunity for Q&A at the conclusion of tonight's program. So any, any questions that go into the chat, John and I are going to have a great one-on-one -on -one at end and I will make sure that your questions get answered. And with that, I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, John Shane. John is a biologist who spent the past four decades studying brown bears, deer, and mountain goats, and advocating for conservation of Alaska's Tongass National Forest. His recent book, Tongass Odyssey, is a memoir of his experiences in the Tongass over the decades. And I am so thrilled that he is here to join us tonight and share his story. Thank you, Monica. It's uh, great to be here with everybody this evening, and I'm going to try to uh, get my screen share working. There we go. Ah, there we go. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of my research and conservation experiences on the Tongass National Forest. And the Tongass is um, one of the Earth's largest and most intact full-growth temperate rainforests. 
My goal today is to provide you with a flavor of my new book, Tonga's Odyssey. I'll approach this in three parts. First, I'll discuss the biology of the Tongas. Next, I'll describe some of the politics of Tongas conservation. And finally, I'll share some personal reflections over the last four decades. Following my graduate work at the University of Washington, my wife Mary Beth and I moved to Alaska in 1976, where I started work with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I began my deer research uh, out of Juneau in 1977 with colleagues Charlie Walmo and Matt Kirchhoff. In the 70s, the Forest Service was clear cutting about 18,000 acres annually on the Tongass. I vividly remember the very first field trip I had to Admiralty Island. We were flying in a beaver float plane from Juneau down the west shore of Admiralty. We turned in at Hawk Inlet where the department had a research cabin. Uh, flying into Hood Bay, uh, there was a small pod of humpback whales feeding on herring at the mouth of the bay. Flying up the, the bay and losing altitude, getting ready to land, we saw scores of bald eagles, the white heads of eagles perched in ancient spruce and hemlock trees in the beach fringe forest. We touched down and taxied to the shore and got off the float plane and onto the shores and we saw enormous brown bear tracks. We could hear the raucous calls of gulls and ravens and crows and we heard the booming of dusky grouse in the trill of the varied thrush. And I thought to myself, John, this is work and I'm getting paid to do this. Unbelievable. So I wanna just step back and take a big picture view of what temperate rainforests are. They occur, temperate rainforests are actually uh, much more rare than tropical rainforests. They occur in middle and upper latitudes in both hemispheres. They have maritime climates with cool temperatures and abundant rainfall throughout the year. There are six major temperate rainforests on Earth, uh, noted on this map in red. And the largest temperate rainforest is the North Pacific temperate rainforest uh, uh, in the uh, Northwest portion of North America. And here's an image of the North Pacific temperate rainforest starting in Northern California, moving up the Pacific coast through Oregon and Washington and British Columbia and into Southeast Alaska, all the way up to the Kenai Peninsula. The arrows point to the location of the Tongas. And note that the red area on this map indicates temperate rainforest that's largely been clear cut. Uh, the green areas are more of the natural distribution of the forest yet to be cut. And clearly it's Northern British Columbia and Southeast Alaska where the majority of this rainforest still exists in its original state. Here's a closer view of Southeast Alaska. The Tongass National Forest uh, makes up the bulk of uh, the area of Southeast Alaska. And it runs from the Canadian border the lower part of the map uh, up to Yakutat Bay, uh, about 500 miles distance. Uh, the green areas are areas below a thousand feet, and that's really where the, the most important forest land occurs. Uh, the Tongass is the largest national forest in the United States, roughly 16.8 million acres, about the size of West Virginia. Uh, it has a shoreline of 18,000 uh, miles, marine shoreline, uh, and includes over 5,000 islands. So uh, island biogeography is a major part of the Tongass. In Southeast Alaska and the Tongass, we still have robust populations of fish and wildlife, including many species that have declined precipitously in their ranges to the south. We have the largest nesting population of bald eagles and marbled murrelets in the world. We have some of the highest densities of brown bear and black-tailed deer uh, in the world. Uh, we have an endemic 
uh, population of the gray wolf uh, that occurs on the southern islands. And we have a very productive uh, uh, runs of all five species of Pacific salmon. Well, we began our deer research in 1977 on Admiralty and Chichikov Island. This is a picture of everything we did was by float plane or boat. And here we're unloading the beaver uh, with our gear on shore and we're going to be camped out in this floating Wanagan doing research on the west side of Admiralty Island. Now, the goal of phase one of our research was to um, evaluate and assess the density of deer using clear cuts and second growth forest compared to adjacent old growth forest. And what we found is that old growth forest provide a, but provides abundant food throughout the year. It has very high habitat value all year long for deer. In second growth forest, there's very little light that gets into the forest. There's very little uh, deer forage or green plants that grow uh, in these uh, relatively sterile habitats and they have very low value as deer habitat all year long. Now clear cuts, these are two recent clear cuts on Chichigoff Island. Uh, they have mid to high value in the summer from about year two to three after clear cutting till about year 25 when the forest starts to close over. But in the winter time, when snow uh, accumulates in these areas, the value goes down uh, sub substantially because all it takes is about four to six inches of snow and the most important highest quality winter food for deer is unavailable. And if you've ever walked through an open area with deep snow, you know how energy intensive it is to move through those areas. And that same situation occurs for deer. So again, we'll step back just a little bit and I want to describe what characterizes an old growth forest. Well, first of all, they include old trees and the average age of trees in an old growth forest is over 300 years. Um, but these forests contain trees of all ages and sizes from seedlings and saplings to ancient trees that are 800 to 1000 years of age. This uneven age structure of the stand results in a broken multi-layered canopy. So sunlight comes in as side light coming in out of the forest canopy and this sunlight getting to the forest floor results in an abundance of forage uh, forest floor vegetation uh, from uh, herbs, uh, ferns, uh, shrubs, uh, and th these plants are very important for herbivores like deer. Another aspect of old growth forest is they have an abundance of dead and down trees like snags. So here is a bird's eye view looking at the canopy of an old growth forest. And you notice the gaps uh, substantial canopy gaps. These silver snags are dead trees, very important, provide a lot of habitat for cavity nesting birds and other species. This is a, a, a higher version from 500 to 1,000 feet, and you get a, a sense of the landscape, and you can really pick out the ragged canopy of this old growth stand surrounded by a sea of second growth you know, that ranges from 30 years to 80 years in age. That just gives you an impression. To many people flying over, an old, flying over a forested habitat, all the forest looks the same. But once you really study this forest and get a sense of it, uh, it's really a patchwork quilt of habitat types. Now, this is a critical thing to keep in mind when we're talking about forest and forest management and conservation. The contrast between an old growth forest on the right and a second growth forest on the left that's 50 years old is stark. You just see the abundance of uh, vegetation, the multi-layered canopy, the, the sunlight coming into the forest floor compared to the second growth forest that's truly sterile. There's really no green plants growing on that uh, site because the overhead canopy is impenetrable, impenetrable to sunlight. But the key factor to keep in mind 
is that when forests are put under management and they're harvested every 80 to 100 years, and that's the standard rotation on the Tongass, these forests are non-renewable. Once an old growth forest is clear cut, put under standard management, it no longer has the, the ecological characteristics of old growth. Keep that in mind for this whole program. Now, here's another key factor. Tongass is 16.8 million acres, the largest national forest in the nation, but it's not all forest. 60% of the, the Tongass is, uh, is forest land, but another 40% uh, include ice fields and glaciers, uh, muskeg bogs, upper alpine and rock, avalanche slopes. Really, this area of productive forest in the upper left hand is uh, what we consider the productive old growth forest or the commercial forest land. It only makes up 30% of the land base of the Tongass National Forest. So keep that in mind. The Tongass is big, but only 30% of it has potential as uh, timberlands. But this gets even more challenging because old growth itself is highly variable. It's not all the same. In the upper right hand corner of the image is a poorly drained uh, stand of small tree old growth primarily Alaska yellow cedar and some hemlock. It's what we call a small tree forest. To the uh, left uh, bottom part of the screen is a large tree old growth. Uh, this is a mixed stand of Sitka spruce right here and Western hemlock. And some of these trees are going to be 600 to 800 years old. Uh, they vary in size from, you know, a couple of feet in diameter to over six and sometimes seven feet in diameter. These stands represent only 3% of the Tongass land base. Now, we're really going from 16.8 million acres down to 3% of that. We're really talking about a small portion. And this small portion of the Tongass is the most important habitat for black-tailed deer, for brown bears, uh, for salmon in the streams to go through these sites, marten and goshawk and bald eagle. There are just a myriad of, of wildlife species and fish that use these sites, but it only represents 3% of the Tongass. This is a key factor. Now, this is my wife, Mary Beth, uh, standing in a floodplain forest on Baranoff Island. These, that tree to the left is six to seven feet in diameter. These are Sitka spruce trees in a floodplain forest. This is really prime bear habitat, especially if there's an Anadra stream uh, going through here. These sites have always been rare on the Tongass. They represent less than half of 1% of the Tongass land base. It's the large tree forest that is the focus of timber management. That's where the big money is. But this is also the forest that's so important for fish and wildlife. So now we're going to move into phase two of the deer research. And I might just point out on the left, uh, the person in the right of the left photo is my colleague, Matt Kirchhoff from Alaska Fish and Game. We worked together for many years and he's holding a black tailed buck that was captured in the Alpine from a helicopter using a net, a net gun that was uh, developed in New Zealand, New Zealand for capturing red deer. Uh, I'm standing next to a super cub. I'm a pilot. I've been flying for 50 years. I did most of my own research flying. And in Alaska, uh, and in our work in Southeast, everything was done by boats and airplanes. So uh, flying uh, an airplane, you can see the telemetry uh, uh, antennas on either side of the wing. Uh, this is how we located our radio collar deer, and we used beaches as our airstrips. Now with individual deer, uh, with radio collars, we could monitor the seasonal habitat use of individual deers in comparison to phase one, where we're looking at the population of deer use as a whole. So now we're looking at individual deer. And we learned that deer uh, in the summertime, they range from sea level 
in the old growth forest and the beach fringe, all the way up to the upper alpine. They had an abundance of food in habitats that had this upper alpine. And uh, they had in uh, seasonal home ranges of about 200 acres in the winter and 200 acres in the summer, but they made altitudinal movements. Uh, the forest in the upper alpine area was available in the summer, but in the winter when the snow came, the deer were forced down to the lower elevation, generally before below a thousand feet into the old growth forest. And this photograph is a bird's eye view. I'm flying the Super Cup, radio locating the deer with radios. And in the winter time when the snow was deep, you can see these muskeg bogs and the deer stayed out of those because it was very difficult to travel, used a lot of energy and there's no food available. And what we found was in heavy snow years, these red areas uh, were around the big large tree old growth stands. And that's where deer focused their use. It was highly preferred in winters of deep snow. And these sites were rare. Again, I mentioned uh, the timber industry targeting the high value forest, the, the large tree forest, uh, which is rare uh, on the Tongass. And this is the most important wildlife habitat. And as you look at this forest mosaic, this area to the lower left, this is a muskeg bog. It's not a clear cut, it's a, a sphagnum bog, very stunted tree growth on the edges. Um, the, this is a, a young clear cut that's probably 15 to 25 years of age. And here are brand new clear cuts in the center. And here's some second growth forest. This is all second growth forest. And you can see patches of old growth here. So just get the sense that um, forest management targets the rarest, most valuable fish and wildlife habitat. And one other comment I'll make is that from the redwood forest in California, all the way up through the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia and Alaska, the farther north you go, the more fragmented the forest is, the smaller the trees are and the less productive the sites are. Now I'm gonna diverge for just a moment and uh, talk about our personal life, life on the home front. When we moved to Juneau in 1977, we lived in a uh, two bedroom uh, duplex in a little suburb uh, just north of Juneau. And we decided we didn't move to Alaska to live in a suburban duplex. So we started searching for waterfront property or view property or something with woods around us. And it was way too expensive, but we found an acre and a half lot where this red arrow is. And that was a site at Smuggler's Cove that didn't have a road, didn't have telephone or electricity, we bought it and we built our own house. That's the Mendenhall Glacier behind us. Uh, downtown Juneau is about 10 miles to the right. Uh, that's a tour boat in the summer right there. And then that's the Mendenhall Glacier. And that's the area I did my mountain goat research. And I'm not gonna talk about that uh, tonight. This is a picture of Mary Beth and our daughter, Sarah and our son, Eric. We commuted every day uh, from our house uh, at Smuggler's Cove to into Fritz Cove Road where we parked our car and then we'd commute uh, to work and then later in for the kids who would go to school they'd catch the bus there. Um, this was really a, an amazing experience. The kids grew up with saltwater beach in the front yard and an old growth forest in the backyard. And I might just mention that Eric now uh, is a professor uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and he focuses his studies on climate change and salmon. And Sarah is a seabird biologist with the Alaska Center, uh, Alaska Science Center in Anchorage. So something must have brushed off on their early childhood. Now, I started brown bear research in uh, 19, or yeah, 1981. Uh, 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 and um, still doing some of the deer research, but wrapping that up. And our objective, uh, we worked on Admiralty and Chichikov Island. Our objective was to look at the seasonal distribution of brown bears and evaluate the effects of logging and mining on bear habitat and bear populations. 
Uh, this is a picture of us with bear number 46 on the upper alpine slopes of Admiralty Island. This is a 550 pound, 11 year old male bear. You can see the white radio collar around his neck. Uh, the person with me is uh, Laverne Beyer, uh, who worked as a wildlife research technician with me on the bear project. Uh, very important partner in this effort. And you can see Vern, we captured on the left, we captured bears with leg hole snares along fish streams or darting them out of a helicopter when they were up in the Alps. A very amazing project and what a privilege it was to work on this species. Now, life does begin in the den. Cubs are born in January or February. Uh, the females go into the dens in October, pregnant females first followed by sing single adult females followed by males. They den in separately um, and uh, they den in under big, large old growth root wads in, on Admiralty Island. A lot of the bears den in rock caves so you can see on the lower left. And this is the entrance, the upper photo of a den on Admiralty Island. And we dropped radio collars on these dens in the winter where we could identify them. Then we'd fly in a helicopter and we'd go in and identify the den site, measure it, and try to understand what the dens, where they were and how they were structured. So this was early May and I'm climbing into this den. And the helicopter pilot and Laverne have, each have one of my feet and I'm going into this den. My shoulders just get into the den entrance and the entrance was just big enough that I get it's a rock cave and it's just enough to get my shoulders in. There's about three feet of snow above this site. And all of a sudden I said, stop. Now, my stress level was redlining because the radio caller was still transmitting from within the den. Now we've seen this bear, this female, number 60, and her two-year-old cup that denned with her in the den over the winter outside the den the week before. We were 99% sure that the bear wasn't in the den. But when you're halfway in this den, it's really dark and the trans, you know the transmitter is going there, it's reason for pause. Well, I went in, found the collar that was shed uh, in the little nest site in this 10 foot long den and brought it out. But that was one of my first experiences going into a bear den. I'll never forget that. So seasonal habitat use. Um, bears come out of their dens and the males start coming out in April and the females come out uh, through May. Pregnant or the females with brand new youngs are the last to come out of the dens. They spend maybe a week or so at the high elevation and then they move down to green vegetation. And this upper left picture is a, a beach sedge meadow. Lots of bears will forage in this area. Uh, they, they feed on skunk cabbage, they feed on roots. And then later, uh, they'll move up into the higher alpine where there's lots of food as the deer move up, the same sort of thing. Uh, so they're spread from sea level all the way up to the alpine. In mid summer, about early July, most of the bears, not all, but most of the bears move down to the fish streams and they have an abundance of bounty, a smorgasbord, of five species of salmon. And then after the salmon finish, the bears move up and they feed on berries and green vegetation. And then they start looking for an, a den site in October and November. Denning is an adaptation for a very living through low quality food resources. And bears are large bodied animals. They really need high quality, abundant, of nutritious food. When the bears hit the spawning stream, each year, millions of salmon migrate up into thousands of rivers and streams that go through the ancient forests of the Tongass. Five species, the, pick, the, the primary species we had in our study area were pink salmon and chum salmon. The photo in the lower right is of chum salmon. Salmon anchor the productivity of coastal Alaska. Over a hundred species of fish and wildlife and invertebrates feed on salmon. Bears play a key role 
A female brown bear may consume as much as a thousand pounds of salmon during the summer season. And uh, salmon really are key factors in this forest. And bears distribute these salmon carcasses throughout the floodplain. They also distribute seeds. So bears play a very important keystone role in the ecosystem. So what are the impacts of logging on brown bears? We learned that clear-cut logging reduces habitat values, not unlike, um, uh, not unlike deer. The second growth forest provides no food at all and bears tended to avoid the clear cuts. Roads increase bear-human interactions. There are thousands of miles of roads now in portions of the Tongass forest. So logging increases, uh, reduces habitat value and increases mortality risk to bears. Both black bears and brown bears, but our work was with brown bears. Now, my work was primarily with mammals, bears, black-tailed deer and mountain goats, but I wanna to touch just very briefly on Tongass birds. Northern goshawks, uh, actually the Queen Charlotte uh, subspecies of goshawks occur in the Tongass. They feed in the old growth forest and they nest in the old growth forest. Bald eagles nest in old growth trees near the shoreline that are three to 400 years of age. Uh, there's an endemic subspecies of the spruce grouse, the Franklin spruce grouse that uses old growth on Prince of Wales Island. And the marbled murrelet is a small seabird about the size of a robin, the lower right-hand corner. And these, many of these birds actually nest in the upper limbs of old growth forest. They do that in Oregon and Washington, all the way up through British Columbia and into Southeast Alaska. And remember that marbled murrelets, the, the focal point of their distribution and abundance is in Southeast Alaska. Downy and hairy woodpeckers uh, nest and feed and breed in old growth forest. And some of the cavities they uh, make are important for the cavity nesting birds that uh, uh, spend the summer in the Tongass. Some of the key uh, birds, uh, uh, passerine birds that uh, nest on the Tongass include uh, red-breasted nuthatches, uh, chestnut-backed chickadees, and uh, varied thrush. There are many other birds as well. I retired from fish and game in 1996 and went to work for Audubon, Alaska. I spent most of my time at, Aud at Audubon as their senior scientist. We joined forces early on. I continued my, my work on the Tongass with Audubon, as well as doing a number of other things, uh, including working in the Arctic Refuge. But uh, I joined forces with my colleague, Dave Albert here, uh, and we developed an eco-regional assessment of Southeast Alaska and the Tongass. And I wanna hit a couple of high points. Uh, here, I landed my airplane on the Katashan Flats on Chichikov Island, where Dave and I were, are standing there. Big, beautiful river delta, really important to bears. So we found that conservation on the Tongass, there's 6.6 .6 million acres of wilderness, designated wilderness, and conservation targeted low quality forest lands. On the left hand, you see Tracy Arm Forge Terror Wilderness, then Misty Fjords National Monument and South Prince of Wales Island Wilderness. These areas have very low value forest lands. In contrast, logging on the Tongass targeted the best forest lands. Well, I guess that's not a surprise. Um, and the Maybe So River, the left-hand picture on Prince of Wales Island, you can see that this was the early logging in the 1950s. There's old growth forest up above the arrow, that I'm, my cursor. This whole river valley was logged from ridge top to ridge top right across the anadromous fish stream. That's how logging was done in the early days of the 50s and 60s. Later in the 70s, the Forest Service went to a patchwork cut, uh, portion of logging. This happens to be muskeg down here, but these are patches of clear cuts with a road system going through. Now, again, what was cut targeted the high value forest, the low value forest would, ended up being the leaf strips for conservation. Native corporations were uh, uh, selected uh, high value timberlands through 
the Alaska National Interest or the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And uh, some of the lands they selected were also some of the highest value lands. Uh, Admiralty Island, uh, the northwest corner of Admiralty, Admiralty Island, Lake Florence here, uh, was selected by Sea Alaska Corporation. And this is Doll Island uh, down on the outer coast uh, near Ketchikan. Now, one of the, I think, most significant things that Dave and I learned uh, when Audubon and TNC teamed up uh, is that the timber harvest really focused on high value old growth. Uh, the, we figured that the large tree old growth, which really makes up only about 3% of the Tongass, represent, represented about 50% of the harvest. I mean, 50% of that large tree old growth is harvested. This is a photograph from Prince of Wales Island, central Prince of Wales. We found that contiguous large tree old growth on Prince of Wales Island, northern Prince of Wales Island, was reduced by 94% from 1954 to 2004. That's astounding. And the impact this has had on species like black-tailed deer and black bears and marten and uh, marbled murrelets and goshawks is really a concern. So that's a little bit of the biology. Now I want to touch on the, some of the, the politics, the science and politics. Um, doing field research on the Tong was really an awesome experience. One of the greatest experiences of my life. But it was balanced with the raw politics of timber. And I'm going to give you two examples. There are a number of examples I talk about in the book, but uh, two examples. Oh, John, you accidentally muted yourself. <laughs> One second here, well. Get John off mute for you. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So doing doing field research on the Tongass was an awesome experience. I'll never forget it. One of the highlights of my life. But that was balanced by the raw uh, politics of timber. I'm going to give you two examples, although there are a number of examples in my book. After phase one of our deer research. Uh, one of our responsibilities was to publish our results in a scientific journal. Uh, we sent Charlie Walmo and I, Charlie worked for the research branch of the Forest Service and me for Fish and Game. We sent our uh, paper out uh, to uh, some deer scientists around the country. They received high marks. Uh, Charlie also sent it to the management branch of the Forest Service, which gave it relatively low marks. And here is uh, here is uh, a response from the regional forester. Uh, and we believe the manuscript needs substantial additions and clarifications if it is to make a positive contribution to an understanding of this controversial subject. Every step of the way, we were challenged by the, the management branch of the Forest Service and the timber industry. Now, this was clearly an attempt to kill or slow down the publication. Fortunately, the research branch of the Forest Service approved it, and we published this paper in Forest Science in 1980. In 1986, I'm doing bear research at this point, I was invited to go back to Washington, D.C. and testify uh, before Congress on our work on uh, wildlife management and research on the Tongass. And what I did, uh, well, uh, to, be, to make a long story short, uh, uh, Chairman Cyberling requested the Commissioner of Fish and Game that I uh, come back and testify. And the Department of the State of Alaska 
said I was unavailable. Well, that wasn't really true. So I deliberated on this, talking with my fishing game colleagues and supervisors and my wife, Mary Beth, and I decided to take annual leave. And I went back and testified on behalf of the Wildlife Society. I took annual leave. And what I did, I showed a slideshow to the House Committee. And key points, old growth forests are rare. Old growth forests are diverse and productive habitats for fish and wildlife, and old growth forests are non-renewable. The next day, the Chief of the Forest Service testified, and his testimony included that they intend to keep uh, uh, a viable population of deer in per perpetuity on the forest. And they're affecting less than one tenth of 1% of the Tongass forest annually and affecting only a small part of old growth. Well, that's true, but you know how you can use statistics. We know that only 30% of the Tongass is commercial forest, only 3% is large tree old growth, and the best forest is high grade. Tongass, Chairman Cyberling made these points in the congressional record. And the Tongass Timber Reform Act passed in 1990. Now, by 2000, scientists recognized that old growth forests were non-renewable and were very important for a variety of reasons, ecologically and for societal values. And there were a number of scientists that uh, wrote letters. Well, one letter that I was involved with was submitted to uh, the Secretary of Agriculture in January of 2015 uh, by seven scientific societies, including the American Fisheries Society, the Wildlife Society, Ecological Society of America, and others. And the key point that we made was that there should be an end to clear-cut logging of old growth forests during the Tongass Forest Plan Amendment process. That was Tom Vilsack, who's now the new Secretary of Agriculture under the Biden administration. Last year, under the last administration, there was an acceleration of clear cutting of old growth and the Tongass was exempted from the national roadless rule. This was a very serious state of affairs. In July 15th of this year, this summer, Secretary Vilsack announced an end to large scale old growth timber sales on the Tongass and rest, a restoration of the roadless rule on the Tongass. This was truly an amazing change. So I began my research in 1977. And during that time, my thinking evolved from single species focus to a, an ecosystem perspective. My goal for this book was to document the ecological impacts of forest management on the Tongass and what we have learned over the last four decades of scientific research. For over 10 years, scientists understood, for over 30 years, scientists understood the ecological values of old growth and realized that clear-cutting these forests was not sustainable, but national and regional leadership of the Tongass was slow to change and failed to integrate new science into forest management. Continued clear cutting of old growth will place at risk many sustainable resource uses from subsistence use to fish and wildlife to commercial and sport fishing, tourism and outdoor recreation, as well as carbon storage. The Tongass is the most, is the, provides the largest carbon sink in the US and plays a valuable role in helping mitigate climate change. It is our responsibility as good stewards not to let short-term economic gain foreclose our ability to maintain long-term sustainability and the ecological integrity of our public lands and waters. So this, this uh, seminar is called the Geography of Hope. And I am hopeful once again this administration's new conservation measures are very significant, but administrations 
can come and go and our administrative actions are subject to change. I encourage you, the audience, to support the great conservation work of groups like the Alaska Wilderness League, Audubon Alaska, SEAC, the Nature Conservancy, Salmon State and others. It's important now for you to use your voices to urge decision makers to permanently end clear cutting Tongass old growth. The Tongass National Forest is the only national forest in the nation that still clear cuts old growth. We need to conserve this national treasure for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to entertain some questions. Thanks so much, John. Um, Hillary, if you can go ahead and uh, do a stop share, we're all set. Um, and first off, I just wanna say, you know, a big thank you, John, um, having known you, but really going through that program and understanding the decades that you put in, not only to the research, but then to the advocacy and making sure that the science was being used to formulate decisions has allowed us to even be in this place where we can talk about permanent protections and still having old growth to save. So um, I did wanna say a big thank you um, to you for that. And um, we've seen a lot of questions come in, which is great, keep them coming in the chat. Um, I'm gonna get them collected. In the meantime, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. As John said, uh, there's some opportunities here for engagement. I'll let Chris share a little bit more. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for being a part of this. It's, uh, it's exciting to see everyone's screen everyone's faces and boxes once again, as, as much as we've loved to get away from Zoom, it's, it's still heartwarming to see folks get together and celebrate wild Alaskan landscapes. And, and John, thanks so much for, for being an, uh, a part of this kickoff of the series. We really appreciated that. Um, I did want to just share a little bit of my screen to, to show, you know, we can't get away from the iconic imagery. And our, our, our good friend, Amy Gulick took this image. Uh, and she's been a part of this series. Um, folks have been, uh, keen to sort of get engaged in this fight. And John certainly teed us up well to, to show the importance of speaking out. Um, and, and I think that's that's step, definitely something we wanna make sure is, is prominent here. You, you will be hearing uh, from us down the road, not too far, hopefully, with a chance to weigh in on some of the Biden administration's recent actions uh, to show your support uh, for, for that effort. Um, in the meantime, uh, we definitely wanna encourage uh, you to take a chance and, and take home a copy of John's book. I'm going to be the, the shameless sales promotion here uh, and, and make sure folks uh, check out their independent local retailers. For, there's a great resource um, on IndieBound.org to find your local bookstore. Uh, there's a great website called Bookshop.org that allows you to purchase directly from them. They help support other independent retailers if they're not, not in many good ones in your region. And then we've also been sharing around the Amazon link. Um, if folks aren't aware of their smile program, uh, whatever your feelings on Amazon are, uh, there is an opportunity to uh, direct some contributions as a result of your purchases through that platform. So we encourage you to make Alaska Wilderness League your per preferred charity. Um, we are going to send around some links about all this information as a follow-up. So no need to hurry up and take notes on this. Uh, you'll get the links uh, early tomorrow along with the reporting, um, but definitely check all those out. Um, and then just continue to stay engaged. Um, you know, Monica mentioned that our members make our work possible, and it's absolutely true. Um, it's been a trying uh, year and a half, really, for all of us. And uh, as a staff level, I can certainly speak to the appreciation I feel every time I get a chance to see everyone on these events, speak to them, and the support that you show really drives our work forward. Uh, and then just keep up to news uh, on all of, our, all of our social platforms, as well as our blog and our news. Um, we have a lot of great resources there that are updated pretty much daily uh, across those. Um, and then finally, mark your calendars. October 19th will be our next presentation. Um, you can RSVP already at alaskawild.org slash geography of hope. Uh, we're really excited to feature um, Max on this journey. He's a great artist, uh, a great traveler, and we're really excited to have that story to share. Um, so spiel's over. I'll turn it back over to Monica and John since I know that there's been some great questions. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And I know we just saw another question if this recording will be posted. Absolutely. Not only will you get it in the email, it will be on our main geography of hope page. You might give us a day or two on our YouTube channel. So um, you are welcome to view it again. You're welcome to share it uh, with friends and family, of course. Um, okay, lots of questions. So thank you very much. Um, 
for putting those in. I will try and get to as many as I can. If there's any we don't get to, or you have others, please always feel free to reach out to me afterwards and I will try and get you the answers. Um, I wanna start kind of in the umbrella of some of the economics, John, since we've gotten a lot of questions um, on those with regards to the, the non-renewable non sense of an old growth. Um, so one, could you just start with explaining a little bit more about what you mean about the old growth not being, being a non-renewable resources um, that you mentioned in your program? Sure. Um, it takes at least two centuries, likely three, to begin developing the old growth characteristics, uh, the ecological characteristics of old growth. Large trees, multi-layered canopies, broad limb structure, um, light into the forest floor, um, a diverse understory, those things take centuries. So if you cut an cut a old growth forest down and then you cut it again in 50, 80, or 100 years, it never gets back to that ecological structure. Old growth is non-renewable on standard timber rotations. That's the key. There's a question about the economics. And I've, I've got some facts uh, that I pulled off uh, the Southeast Conference. Uh, it's really uh, a group of business people in Southeast Alaska, and they put, put these statistics together. Uh, seafood and tourism, which depend on productive forest, represent 25% of the labor force of Southeast Alaska. Salmon is a $1 billion value uh, in Southeast Alaska. Timber, the timber industry on the Tongass represents less than 1% of the labor force in Southeast Alaska. The Forest Service, this comes from Taxpayers for Common Sense. The Forest Service lost on average $30 million a year uh, over the last three decades on timber management on the Tongass. So uh, again, from, the, from TLUMP, the Tongass Land Management Plan in 2016, the Forest Service said that the average timber employment on the Tongass National Forest was 137 people. So uh, old growth is non-renewable. We know that old growth forms the, the fundamental uh, basis for uh, salmon spawning and rearing habitat. We know that it's important for tourism. We know that it's important for the cultural values of the people that live there, uh, especially the Clinket and Haida and Simpson people that have lived there for centuries. And uh, it's important to the people in Southeast for fishing and, and recreation. So the numbers really don't add up. And th that's all I'll say about that. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you. And a quick follow-up, and I don't know if you know the answer, um, but we did have a question come in. Um, and if you had seen any studies or work being done to try and um, come up with a value per tree, taking into things like their ability um, to be a carbon sink and to provide habitat for industries such as fishing and tourism. Um, I haven't seen that. Uh, I bet that uh, Catherine Mater or uh, uh, Dominic Della Sala in Oregon uh, may be a good source of that information, um, but I don't have that information off the top of my head. But, but relative to carbon, the, the fungus represents over 40% of the carbon stores in national forest lands across the nation. It, it's a very substantial carbon sink. And uh, the, a Forest Service biologist, ecologist, uh, has estimated that there are 70 tons of carbon per acre on forested lands in the Tongass. This is above and below ground uh, carbon. So the, the Tongass is one of the really important carbon sinks in the United States. And, you know, it, it doesn't cost us anything. It's there working, you know, sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere and storing carbon. So uh, this is something that's really important right now dealing with climate change. 
Absolutely. And before we jump to climate change, which will um, be our next topic with some questions, Didi, I did see yours come through really quick. It is not a naive question whatsoever. Uh, the short answer is taxpayers um, do <laughs> support the, the loss of money we um, that the Forest Service has. So um, that's been a longstanding uh, kind of issue with Tongas is the, the taxpayer subsidies that are paid to make it um, economical for some of the logging. Um, it is part of the reason why the Tongas had a long history of bipartisan support and why even John mentioned taxpayers for common sense. Um, the tax subsidies have been a long, a long standing issue that have brought folks together to really question uh, the feasibility, not even from an ecological standpoint, but really from a money standpoint of the logging. Um, so again, not, not a naive question. Thanks for bringing it up so that we could flag that important part. Um, and then John, since you mentioned climate, the, the carbon sink and, and the climate change, we did have a few questions related to that. Um, the first being, you know, as with your decades on the ground, kind of in the Tongass, how have you been seeing climate change impact that ecosystem? Uh, the question was specifically, have you experienced any reduced rainfall, which we know is so critical to a temperate rainforest habitat like the Tongass? Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, there's been some really valuable research by Colin Shanley with uh, uh, TNC and uh, University of Alaska uh, Southeast. And uh, they're forecasting that there will be more rainfall, um, that there will be more serious spring and fall flooding. This has an impact on, especially fall flooding on salmon spawning, in that you get these bursts of floods that may wash out some of the eggs out of the streams. Um, so the tree line will likely increase over time, uh, which may impact alpine species. Um, one of the things that is a serious issue right now is Alaska yellow cedar. There's been a die off of Alaska yellow cedar at lower elevation because there's been less snowfall, and when you get a heavy freeze, the roots of yellow cedar have been freezing. They're close to the surface, so there, there is significant mortality of yellow cedar on the, on the Tongass right now. And those are just a few things that, that go on. I think the issue with salmon is going to be a really serious issue. Uh, we're likely to see less uh, significant uh, impacts compared to the Arctic, where, where we're seeing loss of sea ice. I mean, there is a different ecosystem entirely. So the, the rainforest is, is in a more moderate climate, but we will be seeing uh, changes. And the old growth forest really offers uh, resilience to climate change. So I think it's, it's a moderating effect. Yeah, and speaking of salmon, just moving quickly into a little bit of the wildlife questions. Um, there was one, and I did uh, flag for Julie, who asked the question about um, the salmon, um, how, how they are doing population-wise in the Tongass. Um, so I did flag, we had a great conversation with Amy Gulick, um, who got to speak to that. But through your research, John, um, you know what had you noticed over the years? You know, I... I uh... I don't have data myself uh, on that issue. I, there's some concern about salmon size, some concern about specific fish runs, uh, but I don't have detailed information. Salmon State, it's a, an NGO, is a great resource. Uh, Tim Bristol and the folks at Salmon State could probably make available that data real quickly. And I encourage people to go to their website and, and take a look. Um, one thing that I will mention though, the, the summer droughts that will be increasing uh, where we have a number of days of warm weather and where there has been clear cutting, you know, in the, in the history uh, across the floodplain, um, and blow down some of the trees that were left in small buffers where you have these periods of drought, we've seen in the past significant mortality of salmon as the water uh, temperature increases, the dissolved oxygen, uh, the water temperature increases, dissolved 
oxygen uh, decreases and there will be some major salmon die offs. We've seen that happen. Uh, but in terms of current specific information, I'd go to Salmon State or, or go to Alaska Fish and Game and talk to those folks. Great, thank you. And yeah, I mean, we all do recognize the critical importance that, you know, these healthy old growth forests play on uh, healthy salmon uh, ecosystems and streams. Um, so there's an absolute connection, which um, <laughs> we've heard many times uh, through Amy and her work, Salmon in the Trees. Um, Monica, Monica, yep. could I interrupt? I saw a flash about 10 minutes ago about a question. Why can't we uh, open up the forest canopy in the second growth and make more light available to produce deer browse? And that's a great question. And uh, Dr. Paul Alabak at Oregon State University uh, addressed that question. And then later he moved to the University of Montana and others have looked at that. When you get a second growth forest, it eliminates the food. You can open it up and you can bring some of the green vegetation back sooner than you would if you waited to, for two or 300 years. The problem is that those young trees aren't going to provide the necessary platform for marble murrelet nesting, for bald eagle nesting, for goshawks. That's a problem. As you open up a thin stand, those the big structure of the old growth forest isn't going to intercept snow. So during a heavy snow winter, you're, you're going to have lots of snow on the forest floor. It's not a simple matter of just thinning. A lot of people have looked into that. There are some opportunities to, to keep the forest open longer with thinning, but thinning is very expensive and you have to deal with thinning slack. So those are just a couple of caveats relative to that question. Wonderful, thank you for catching that. And just to kind of build on the complexities that are not only old growth forest, but also the Tongass it's, itself. Um, Dave, I saw that you uh, gave some love to John's book, so thank you. Um, he was also curious, and this um, you might be able to speak to based on your research. Um, he said, could you explain the curious puzzle of the absence versus presence of brown and black bears and wolves on certain islands of the Tongass and not others? Well, I think that's, uh, that's longer than we have right now, but uh, <laughs> brown bears are very likely keeping black bears off of the Northern Islands. Brown bears occur on Admiralty, Baranoff and Chichikov, the big Northern Islands, they don't occur on the Southern Islands, except occasionally they get to Mitkoff and Kupernoff, just a few animals. Um, uh, wolves haven't been established on the Northern Islands. Um, and uh, the black bears uh, on the Southern Islands, I, I just, whoops, I, we lost. Am I still there? We've, we've... Yep, you're good. Okay, okay, <laughs> I hit something and there we go. So, so there are several papers that have been written on that topic that you could look up. Natalie Dawson, who is the executive director of uh, Audubon Alaska, has done a lot of work uh, on that uh, topic on island biogeography. Um, what, one interesting thing about brown bears on Admiralty Baranoff and Chichikov, um, they are more based on genetics research, they're more closely allied to polar bears than the ancient stock of brown bears. And the idea is that polar bears at one time occurred uh, down through Southeast Alaska. And the, as the glaciers receded and the ice pack receded, polar bears moved north, but there was some integrating between polar bears and brown bears. So there's a, there's a genetic affiliation with the ancient stock of brown bears and polar bears in the ABC islands. That's what we call Admiralty Baranoff and Chichikov. Very interesting situation. So it's all about glaciation and uh, colonization uh, of those islands, and really an interesting topic. And it could take up a whole seminar in itself. Uh, yes, that's what we're learning, uh, this. Um, so one last question for you, and then I'm gonna answer one about um, some of the 
what we can do and what we're looking at in terms of some legislation. But I was hoping, I know you touched on this a little bit in your talk and I had made a note and we just got a question on it. Um, if you could talk a little bit about why when we talk about the Tongass National Forest as a whole, um, really it's, it's more complex than that. And there exists a variety of land uses and designations within the Tongass. And if you could just kind of share a little bit about what those are and, and the difference between them. Well, there, there are areas of designated wilderness that Congress established. Uh, Congress also established some land use designation too, which are roadless areas like the Kadishan area I mentioned. Uh, that was done in 1990 they in the Tongass Timber Reform Act they established some additional wilderness and some land use designation too that's roadless. And then under Clinton, they developed an administrative rule, the roadless rule, it's a national rule. And there are 9 million acres of ro designated roadless area on the Tongass. And, <coughs> and you cannot build roads, although there are some exceptions from, for small hydro areas uh, sites and for connecting some communities, but developing big roads and commercial logging is not allowed in roadless areas. Um, there's a relatively small amount of area, you know, a million plus acres that are designated timber uh, areas. Uh, but again, you have to keep in mind that the amount of large tree old growth that's considered commercial quality timber is really relatively rare on the Tongass. The Tongass, people just lose sight of the fact it's a nearly 17 million acre forest. So what's the problem? But over the last 70 years, the focus of timber harvest has been on those rare large tree forests. The opportunities now are much less. And let me just say that I think the Tongass is probably the best place on earth to protect the ecological integrity of a temperate rainforest that maintains all its natural ver variety and diversity. We've lost that on Vancouver Island. We've lost much of that in Haida Gwaii, the former Queen Charlotte Islands and in Northern BC. Uh, there just there aren't any opportunities compared to the Tongass, but you really have to be careful with percentages because of this complex mosaic that occurs on the Tongass. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you. And, and with that and the mention of opportunity, I did want to flag again. There were some questions about um, you know what folks could do, and you know as was mentioned earlier. Um, Right now, a lot's been dictated by the administration that's been in the White House, and we've seen this roadless rule bounce back and forth, as John mentioned a few times. Um, fortunately, right now, we're looking at the reinstatement um, and the inclusion of the Tongass in the roadless rule, which would be a huge step to uh, prevent large-scale old growth logging um, moving forward. And there's been a really significant commitment to ending old growth logging permanently in the Tongass. Um, we are expecting an announcement of a public comment period, which is an opportunity for all of you to elevate your voices and share with the administration why this uh, issue is important to you and why it should go forward uh, any day now. So um, you will be hearing from us once that's announced and we'll be providing you a really easy opportunity to make sure that you can participate in that public comment period. Um, additionally, there were some questions about kind of the groups working on this. Um, you know, we are thrilled to be Part of a coalition of groups, many of whom John mentioned on this call, both local and national um, through Southeast Alaska and Salmon State included, um, it, you know, throughout the years working on the Tongass issue. Um, there's a lot of conversations happening right now about what long-term permanent protection looks like, um, really being led by folks and communities on the ground, which is important and we're supportive and uh, being included in those conversations um, is exciting for the opportunities we recognize. Really the opportunities that we have in the lower 48 are to keep the importance of this issue elevated so that when opportunities arise that we can take action and we can move forward some of these proposals that local communities and um, frontline communities are going to 
to come up with as a way to, you know, protect the forest permanently, then, um, you know, we only will get there because this issue has a national presence. Um, and so, you know, just we will be continually providing opportunities for you guys to get engaged um, and help us achieve that for the Tongass. And as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, uh, just being cognizant of time, I am going to thank John and, and thank all of you for joining us tonight, though I'm duly impressed there are still so many of you here joining us live tonight. Um, if we did not get to any of your questions, uh, my apologies. I hope I got to most of them. I think Chris put in the chat. Uh, you are always welcome to email us at any time um, if you did have additional questions after this program. And again, we look forward to seeing you in a few weeks here. Uh, in October when we welcome Max Rami for our next Geography of Hope program. And with that, again, thank you all. It was so great seeing so many familiar faces. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>